Great. Thank you. My name is Ian Martin. I'm the Europe News Editor for Forbes. Thank you for joining us and joining Robert for a talk about e-commerce and the history of Zalando and what we can learn about changes in the sector. So, Robert, take us back to 2008 when you co-founded Zalando. Like, what was happening in Berlin at the time? And like, how did you set out to build this business? Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you for, for being here. Um, yeah, so I think we started Zalando 15 years ago, so it was... Um, it was a very different time at the, uh, at the, at, uh, when we started. It's like me and my co-founder, we were kind of 23 when we started. And I think, um, if, I was, if I look back, I think in retrospect, I think what really helped, or what was really happening at that time, um, I think there was this, ge this generation shift. It was like, you know, millennials, like, such as me, like born after, after 1980, were actually entering into, into retail, were entering into, into the workspace, were really becoming like, important for, for consumption. And I think that's, that really created, I think, a lot of, um, kind, of kind of growth for e-commerce in general and as well for e-commerce in, in fashion lifestyle. And that's, I think, very much I think, what, we, what we had like 2009 uh, when, we, when we started out. And basically what we, what we did, if I would now recall in retrospect, I think what really um, has laid the foundation for, for our success in the, in the very early days was, I think, number one, that we um, democratized, democratized fashion so that you can actually have... Um, have access to fashion wherever you are. Like uh, if you're living like in, in Helsinki or if you're living like in north of Finland or if you're living in, in Italy, it doesn't really matter. You have the same access to a, like a huge selection. Yeah? And uh, the second thing that we, uh, that we catered was actually that we worked on every single problem that people might have in order to not order. Yeah? So like uh, the risk, uh, um, uh, so taking away the risk of it. So we worked on deferred payments so that you don't have to pay uh, before you actually really want to dis if you, if you decide at home that you want to have it. Uh, we worked on, um, uh, on re return, so we actually made it very easy for people to return. Yeah? So basically there's nothing really left in terms of not trying it out. And then I think the third aspect was very much that we were very, um, very quantitative and very analytical and very numbers-based, so that actually allowed us to invest uh, much more through the cycle in terms of marketing, in terms of customer lifetime uh, value. Yeah, we were actually out, um, yeah, like, like outbidding many of our competitors because we just knew of how to actually, um, how, uh, of how actually the return on investment of these areas are. So I think that, were, that was pretty much, I think, the, the biggest source of the first years of success. That's great to hear. I think kind of Zalando has kind of changed and evolved like from a pure e-commerce player. Now you sort of have in-person retail. Like sort of how, how is that kind of journey shaped? Like is that kind of reflecting what your customer wants, so kind of a different experience in person, or have more of a relationship with Zalando? Sorry, I didn't we? Oh, sorry. The audience yeah. is a little bit difficult here on stage. So I think Zalando has changed quite a lot over those 14 yeah, years. Yeah. Like from being a pure e-commerce player, now you have physical stores and increasingly focused around brands. Is that reflecting a change in what the consumer wants from you and from e-commerce? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, uh, you know, I think there is, like, as I said, I think there has been, there has been these shifts, I think, in the, in, the, in, the, in the early days that really brought, um, I think, a lot of, uh, a lot of the growth um, uh, to us. And I think over time, I think you always have to adapt a little bit. What are actually next kind of, what, what are kind of next kind of shifts that, um, that, you, that you're seeing? And I think, especially now in, the, in these years, yeah, um, um, the next kind of shifts that we, that we see and that really affect the fashion lifestyle space is, um, first of all, I think there's now a new generation shift yeah, coming out. Yeah? So the millennials, like, that was like my generation. And, uh, and now there's actually a second generation, the, the, the generation Z, like those ones, that really were born with um, um, when the internet was there. Yeah? So where they, were, they grew up with mobile phones, they grew up with social media, they grew up with very different kind of experience. They didn't really have the trust issues, I think, towards the internet as much as like, you know, the previous generation. Yeah. So, and they, um, um, and the, this generation actually now is, um, is entering as well, like the, the workforce and, and becoming like, important for, for, for retail, for lifestyle e-commerce, and there comes a lot of different perspectives and, and things with it. Yeah? So this is a hugely affecting, at the moment, the, the, the fashion lifestyle space. The second big shift uh, that we see is, um, is sustainability. Yeah? So, uh, the fashion lifestyle space is, is an area that um, is a polluter on, on many, many aspects. And, um, and this really um, brings uh, or forces for good like the industry to think much more um, different about like, how to actually um, uh, yeah, how to enable better solutions. Yeah? 
and uh, about circularity around um, the, the usage of materials. So sustainability is a big disruptor, I think, in the, in the overall space um, for good. And the third aspect is, as well, a big, uh, big theme is generative AI, yeah? it's, it's technology. Because if you think about fashion um, and lifestyle, there's so much based on, um, on, uh, on, on, on visual consumption, on, on, on textual consumption, on, on, uh, on discovery, on, on, um, um, uh, on visualization, on emotions. And, um, um, and what computer vision and, gener and generative AI as what textual based, what it can and what it will do, uh, will be hugely disruptive for how digital lifestyle e-commerce can be, can be thought in the next couple of years. So these are kind of three big shifts that come together into a big mega shift, I think, in fashion lifestyle. So that makes it, I think, hugely, hugely interesting at the moment. That's great to hear. I wonder if we can go a little bit deeper on one of those points raised about the kind of trust gap with a younger generation of, of consumers who are, more focused on who are more focused on sustainability and want to know more about the products that they're buying. How do you bridge that as a Lando? It's, it's very hard for me to... <laughs> it's very tough. Let's yeah. move it a little bit closer. Yeah, yeah perfect. Um, so, hoping to go a little bit deeper on that kind of topic of the kind of trust gap yeah. with this new generation of consumers who are very focused on sustainability. Like, yeah. How do you bridge that with Zolando? How we bridge the trust gap between, yeah. between consumers? I, well, I think um, one of the... Um, like one of the main themes, I think, for us, how we, how we see ourselves um, to, uh, to invest is actually that we provide quality e-commerce. Yeah? So in quality e-commerce uh, experience actually has a, like this quality theme is a big theme for us because it has like sustainability in that, like long-term thinking. It has uh, enabling, um, over-delivering our expectations. Yeah? It has um, working with partners as well that, that, that they want to, like with, with many, thought, many brand partners, they really want to build long-term solutions. And I think this, this aspect of, of trust, of, of quality, uh, is very much tied yeah, uh, with each other. And um, so quality is a, big, is a big theme for us. Um, the second big theme that we are uh, working on um, is, um, is actually moving much more upstream. Yeah? So to give much more information to the, to the customers, give much more sources of inspiration give much more, um, uh, invest uh, through generative AI into much more areas of to explore. So we launched, for example, Zalano Stories, which is a big theme where consumers can interact with the experience on, um, uh, in, in a very different way that actually is beyond the transaction, but can just actually as well explore how, how do you shop more for, sustainable, uh, for more sustainable articles? What, what, is, uh, what is this article about? What's the value chain of this article about? Yeah? So moving upstream, investing into content is the second big theme. And the third big theme that we're investing uh, towards is actually enabling everything that we've done, you know, all the infrastructure that we've built to brands and um, give them a meaningful way to, um, to use our infrastructure to operate as well outside of Zalando, right? so that they can tap all the infrastructure themes that we've built and, uh, and, yeah, and run their own brands for Europe um, out of, out of, um, on our infrastructure and as well for their own e-com and, and outside of Zalando. Was it a challenge to kind of switch from being an expert in logistics and fulfillment and returns to building out this experience in storytelling or kind of content to kind of reach these new consumers? Well, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty much a journey. I think, um, as I said, I think the, the first generation shift that we have had, I think actually sustained it like if the, the, the logistics and returns, as you said, infrastructure, that has been like a big big theme of success. And I think in the second, um, uh, in, in our second wave of, um, of, um, of the consumers, building out more experiences will matter even more so. Yeah? So, uh, so we bought like a company, uh, Heist Nobiety, which is an expert in, the, in, in that space and really has been the influencers of influencers. And I think they, they already help us quite a bit to generate like, um, like high quality content that we see actually people really engaging with and being, um, being, being, uh, being more, much more up to funnel for, for people in their experience. That's great. For many founders, they view the IPO, the public listing, as maybe an exit or kind of like a milestone on the journey. But like you've continued to execute past that now. It's nine years after your listing. Yeah. In that time, many of your rivals from that generation have faced significant challenges in the public markets. Yeah. What does it take to continue to execute quarter by quarter and to continue to grow the business over that time? 
Yeah, so, yeah, exactly. so we started Zalando in 2008, yeah, and uh, so I'm doing this now for 15 years. Um, and uh, for the bigger part of our life, we've been a public company, and for the smaller part of our life, we've been a private company now. Yeah? So, so after six years, we, we went public. And, um, and I think what, it's, uh, what, it, what it really takes, I think, in these in this, in this terms is, I think, some, some level of resilience. <laughs> and, um, uh, and as well, managing, I think, the curves, yeah? so um, managing the emotional curves that the company actually goes through. And it's never like this. It's always like a little bit like that. Yeah? So, when actually there's a lot of success, I think you, you don't really have to get carried away and overpromise on things. And actually, when things are a little bit more more, more tough, um, I think you actually have to have to keep on motivating yourself that it actually goes goes back again. And I think that's probably one of the recipes I think that we are, that we as um, as leadership team have always tried to live by. I think the COVID times really brought like a tremendous growth for us. Yeah, and I think it would have been easy to say that that was us, but it wasn't. And so it was because there was a lot of a lot of things happening. And I think these times that we're now walking through as well are very disruptive. Um, but we keep on trying to do the right things and investing through a cycle. And in these area, three areas that I mentioned, and I'm very sure that in the, in the long term, it's, um, it's going to be, again, uh, back to double-digit growth. That's great to hear. Um, I think Zalando is in unusual in that you have a co-CEO structure. Like, has that been helpful in terms of working with your co-founder to have that resilience to keep performing over nine years as a public company? Uh, yeah, I think it, it, has, it has been. So um, we have, so my co-founder and I, um, we still run it as co-CEOs. And we've always run it as co-CEOs, so from day one. Uh, we are best friends. He's, uh, he's, uh, like, you know, he's godfather of uh, my, my kids, and I'm, I'm of his. And so we're best friends, and we are, uh, we really, I think, over the years, really balance it as, uh, they balance out very well. So he hangs out a lot with the fashion brands, yeah? so, and, 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 and in the, in the buying and, and, and supply piece of the business. I do much more in the distribution and technology and, and, and these areas and investors. And um, I think um, such a co-CEO structure is, is very well working if you trust each other from day one, as we do, um, and uh, if you actually balance each other's strengths very well, and that's what we do. I, I'm not sure if I would recommend it like for people that don't know each other, because I think it actually needs a lot of um, common heritage and, and history. But if it works out, it's very beautiful. It's very good. That's great to hear. And we've learned there's kind of been a shift and there's a focus among your consumers on sustainability and on brands. But clearly, there's a segment of the market that is still like very motivated by price and fast yeah. fashion, I think, is bigger than ever. What does it take to be like an e-commerce player in kind of an era where sort of Chinese fast fashion brands like Shein and Timu are becoming increasingly active in Europe and beyond? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think these these models have been uh, have been um, have been notably like very successful in the last uh, last couple of years. I think it's I think first of all it's very it's something very different than Zalando. It's like we work with six and a half thousand brands, like a like a customer of Zalando over two years, um, buys nineteen different brands with us. Uh, so we're focused on, on on high quality e-commerce. So it's a uh, very local in, in Europe, only active in Europe. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very different thing, first of all. Yeah? So, but um, what, what I think it is and what I, make, what I, what I take from it is um, it has, I think, three components probably. So the first one is, um, especially now in these times, consumers are trading down. Yeah? So consumers are, don't have as much money, so they're trading down in these, in these price segments. Um, and this happens at the moment at scale around the world. Yeah? So a second... Um, a second thing that enables these, these players to be very successful at the moment is um, regulatory loopholes. So and you have regulatory loopholes um, in, in Europe at scale at the moment, uh, so they don't pay any customs, for example, because like, everything that's, uh, every shipment that goes directly into the European Union below 150 euros is actually customs free. And all other brands, fashion brands that sell within Europe, actually have, yeah, they pay customs, yeah? so they have actually, they have, uh, they, have a, they, they actually have a loophole there, and as well with uh, regulatory um, uh, topics, um, there's a different kind of level of scrutiny you can apply to players that are outside of Europe than within Europe. Yeah? So th that's the second thing, and then the third thing is, um, is how these companies use data in a value chain, from customers to, the, to, 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 to factories and back, yeah? upstream, downstream. Um, and I think this is actually very, very good what they do in these, these areas. It's actually very disruptive and, 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 and for positive. 
So I think the first two arguments, they, the first two things, they will fade away over time. But I think the third one is here to stay, and I think there's a lot to learn for the fashion industry from how to use data actually for, uh, for, to improve things. I mean, what would it take for some of your playing, what would it take to level the playing field here in Europe or for European competitors to kind of compete with these challenges? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think it's for the, for the regulation of technology companies, I think in Europe, I think one of the aims I think, I think should be that it should be, um, if you work for Europe, yeah, it should be better to be present in Europe than it's actually to not be present in Europe. Yeah? So I think that should be, I think, some goal of the regulation that it's actually a goal to be headquartered in Europe, pay your taxes in Europe, and be like employ people in Europe that, you know, that, that there's actually benefit from that. And um, if I would see that as the, as the mission, or at least one part of the mission of regulation, I don't see it's at the moment that it's there yet. Yeah? So we, um, just speaking of like this, the, these other types of companies we just talked about, I think like, you know, we, um, Zalano, we, last year only, we spent about 40% of our central tech resources on regulatory topics, yeah? like local regulatory topics or like um, EU level regulatory topics. So there is a huge investment that we actually do to comply with regulation and, and, and reporting. Yeah? And I think the same amount of investments um, are actually not, not done outside of companies that are operating for Europe. Yeah? So there's a lot of, I think, innovation that then can happen outside of Europe for the European market that actually the European companies actually don't, cannot do because they just you know, work on regulation um, uh, so much of their pipelines. So I think that actually needs to change over time a bit more, that, um, that the regulation enables companies that operate from Europe actually have as well a reason for being here within the European Union. I'm curious, I think there's kind of scrutiny around fashion play, fast fashion players grows and the kind of the regulatory concern grows around this as well. Like, is it possible for these kind of brands to use the platform and the customer base they built to kind of move up markets, to kind of upscale or kind of like upsell from where they are now? Um, sorry, I, I did Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just to recap the question, yeah. you know, sort of these fast fashion platforms have built sort of yeah. a huge audience huge revenue base, yeah. but scrutiny from the consumer and the regulator grows month by month. Is it possible for them to move up the value chain to like kind of focus around sort of brands with the customer base they've built? Well, I think, I think it could be. Um, I, I think, um, I just think it's a very different model if you try to align your interests fully with brands yeah. um, than uh, if you, if you, um, if you actually build a brand, yeah. So that's that's why, for example, like uh, we have um, we have had like a big private labels business in the past, so we actually produce fashion brands, uh, which um, which was not is not a must do because we actually align our interests with the brand. So our interest is to make a brand successful in Europe and help them as a as a platform in between to to talk to more than 50 million people in Europe, and so we have 50 million customers across Europe per year. So so that's one of the key things that we do. And I think that requires a lot of trust and interest alignment with brands. And I don't, um, I think, I don't see how you can run the same uh, model when you actually at the same time actually have a huge um, business that actually disrupts brands. Yeah? It's interesting. Earlier this year, the European Union announced new content rules called the Digital Services Act. Zalando was named as one of the large, or large online organizations as part of that, as a result of like, your large customer base. I know that you've launched a legal action to challenge this classification. Like, what, what is the impact of this law on Zalando as a business? Yeah, it's again about regulation, and, and you know, we, uh, as, as you know, we, um, we, we've, uh, we, um, we fight against uh, not being considered as a very large online platform by, by, by the DSA, um, because I think it doesn't really take into full account our entire model, yeah, as a, as, um, as a retail at heart, like with a very high quality content that we curate, uh, uh, that we create on Zalando. And um, I think while the DSA doesn't, doesn't like, is, is, of a, is of a good purpose and actually solves something, I think us being considered as a very large online platform under the DSA for various kind of legal reasons is, is not what we think is the right thing to do and there's, uh, there's judgment is still out. Huh? Mm. That's good to know. Maybe if we kind of zoom back to 2008, like if you could talk to like a younger Robert back then before finding Zalando, what would you, what would you tell yourself then? 
Back in the days, you mean? Uh, yeah. Would you do this again? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I've seen this um, this um, the statement of the um, of the Nvidia founder uh, recently that who was asked this question and he said, "Don't do it." Um, um, he said, "Like the, I will tell my younger self, don't do it." I don't know. I think um, I think starting a business, uh, scaling a business over like 15 years is a, is a, is a choice of a lifestyle. Yeah? It's a, it's a, like you know you you. You go to bed with the with the promise. You wake up with the promise for 15 years. So it's it, like it's a it's a choice of a lifestyle. But I think you do it for good. You create something. You um, you, you employ you employ many people, and you I think as well look back and create something that you can be proud of. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it comes with a cost. It comes with a cost on on, on 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 sleepless nights. It comes with the cost of of pressure. It comes with the cost of uh, of a lot of responsibility and accountability. And yeah, and but I would still say like you know. To my younger self, do it. Yeah, it's a, it's a good thing to do, and you will be proud of what you have done. That's great to hear. Now you're running one of the largest e-commerce businesses in Europe. I think you've changed the way that millions of Europeans have shopped and experienced retail brands. Like, you know, from your position now, like, what still excites you about sort of retail and e-commerce? What excites me? Yeah. yeah. Well, as I said, I think these three shifts that we see in in, in, in Europe, uh, fashion lifestyle in Europe, like generation shifts, um, the technology shifts. And sustainability, they create a lot of opportunities uh, for for companies to to reinvent themselves, and um, and I think that's uh, that's that was something that actually really excites me. How we now, with our huge structure of like you know more than 50 million customers, more than 7,000 brands that um, that we work with, um, how we how we uh, take on these uh, these new shifts as opportunities that we now execute on. And yeah, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff that we are working on. I'm very, very passionate with the teams to, to, um, to see the progress that we're making on these areas. If you're a young founder starting out again, like, what, what would, you, would you focus again on e-commerce? Or like, what in e-commerce do you think you would focus on now if you start from scratch? Um, well, I think the, the fashion and lifestyle area is, uh, is an area that is um, different from Men from the e-commerce space in, in the way that it is actually not um, it is not as functional as like you know selling books or selling electronics. So you don't only with just a few informational points actually um, actually uh, satisfy customer need. Yeah, and it has actually very very particular problems yeah? or challenges. Yeah? So one of the core challenges uh, that we have, for example, in fashion, is the size and fit problem. It's how do you how do you actually really make um, make sure when a consumer orders something that it actually fits uh, fits her? Yeah? And um, and I think these problems they, they require a lot of in depth innovation that go into very different um, in, in, in depth on the on the value chain in depth on on the consumer. And these are very exciting problems to solve for that I think you don't you don't solve for um, when you actually you know, just operate across the board. So yes, I think the fashion lifestyle space is is an area that I think offers a magnitude of very, very interesting problems that are still at the moment unsolved for. And, um, yeah, and I'm very passionate to solve these problems. Eh? That's great to hear. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us today. And thank you to Robert for sharing his insights on building the business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eh? Okay.